Hey, welcome everyone. This is One Mic Night Talk. Today, I'm Marcos Luis. Today, we are One Mic Night Talking. My guest today is an occupational therapist, and we're going to be talking about dementia, which affects a lot of people around the world. So sit back. We're going to learn what she does, the causes of dementia, and how we can help ourselves and help each other get through it in an effective way. So sit back and get ready. Let's go. This is One Mike Night Talk. Stick around. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to One Mic Night, the podcast that brings you stories of artists and people on their journey, helping to guide, answer questions, and motivate you in life and the business. If it's your first time here, welcome, welcome, welcome. For all of you returning, thank you for coming back, and thank you for supporting me for 18 years. Before you do anything else, please drop down, like the episode, and if you like the episode, please share, share, share. This episode today is a one mic night talk, and you know we have a lot of value to give you, so stick around. My guest today is incredible. She is an occupational therapist. We're going to be talking about dementia today. Her name is Lizette Kluta. And that's correct. You did it. We're going to dive on in, so welcome to the show. Thank you so very much for having me today. I'm very, very excited to speak to you. As am I. So thank you for taking time out of your schedule. Listen, I have questions. Go for it. <laughs> the first question is, who is Lizette Luta? Lizette is a very confused and confuddled human. Mm. <laughs> I um, was originally, well, no, I... I was born in South Africa, but I told you before we got onto the program that I have an interesting backstory related to New York. So I'm going to share that with you today. Uh, My father was a diplomat for the South African government when I was growing up. And his first posting was in New York. So even though I was born in South Africa, I lived in New York from the age of three until the age of eight. And so I started school in um, Manhattan at uh, the Hewitt School as a child. And my backyard was um, Central Park. So I have a very interesting growing up experience because a lot of people, when they speak to me at first, they do not pick up I'm from South Africa because my accent is not a typical South African accent. And I believe that's because I actually learned to speak English in the United States as a child. I love that. Yeah, they say that the impressionable time for children is about two years old, Mm -hmm. right? So yeah. Two to 18. Two to 18. Okay. Wow. That's incredible. So what what did that bring to you, like living in New York and being from South Africa? What kind of... It was an interesting time. I was a, you know, it, the the years that we lived in New York were still in the apartheid era. Mm-hmm. And so I grew up outside of apartheid because I grew up in New York. But then mm-hmm. when we'd go back to South Africa as a very white South African woman, uh, my sister and I were not used to the apartheid system. 
And so when we would see things, we were like, mommy, daddy, why can they not go into the bathroom with us? Why can they not drink out of the water fountains the same way we do? So we had a totally different cultural, even though we were from South Africa. So to me, the whole apartheid thing was like my, my head really never wrapped around it because people are people and all people are the same. We're all created in the image of God and there's no difference between me and any other human being on this earth. And so I think it gave me a very different view of the world in the fact that I lived in so many different countries between the ages of one and 18. I love this because I say this almost er on every episode. When you travel, that is the best education you can have mm -hmm. because you get a different perspective of life. And more importantly, you learn about yourself. Yes. Beautiful. Yeah, we definitely, you know, we, the thing that I want people to always remember, and this is the thing I find the most interesting in dementia and dementia caregiving, is that our unique story is important. How we grow up, where we live, the influences we've had. Oh my gosh. Please say that again. Say that again. That's very important. How we grow up, mm. where we live, yes. and the influences we have impact everything that we do. Absolutely. And so when we're older and we, we start to have difficulty with dementia, uh, you grow up. Like I have a gentleman who um, I'm working with a client right now. Her husband is a Native American and she is struggling to get him to take a shower. Mm. And I said to her, I'm like, tell me where he grew up. And she's like, he grew up on a reservation. I'm like, did he ever take a shower? Did he even have a shower when he was growing up? Wow. He's in his 80s. She's like, no. I'm like, then your your expectation that he's going to take a shower is unrealistic. <laughs> so the reason I bring that up is because every single person is unique and our stories matter, especially when we um, have dementia. Absolutely. And they're valid. Absolutely. They are so valid. This is interesting. I want to, can, let's, can we start by saying what the definition of dementia is? Because, and, also Alzheimer's, because a lot of people confuse okay. the two or they don't understand what the two are. Okay, I can absolutely do that. So I'm going to start with the word dementia. Mm -hmm. It's <clears throat> a Latin term that means, sorry, I've got a crick in my throat. That's okay. I've been sick lately. That's okay. So it literally means out of your mind. That's the just the term, the mm -hmm. word, the Latin term. But I want people to picture an umbrella. And the word dementia is the umbrella. It is a category of different types of difficulty with your brain, right? And underneath that umbrella of the word dementia, you have 19 primary types of dementia. Alzheimer's is one of them. Okay. Okay. Underneath Alzheimer's, so now we have a big umbrella, and then we have 19 little baby umbrellas underneath it. Underneath the umbrella of Alzheimer's disease, there are more than just one. There are different types of Alzheimer's. So in total, they are talking about over 100 subtypes of dementia now. Really? Yep. So you're talking about, in terms of dementia, you're talking about uh, symptoms that Correct. occur. It's just the fancy <clears throat> word for neurocognitive impairment. Okay. Brain thinking impairment, right? Right. So it, it typically start. it's when there are two types of things in the brain going on. What we typically see or what people typically notice first is memory, not remembering things. Mm -hmm. um, but it's more than that. It can include things like personality changes or 
inability to plan or inability to uh, manage time, those kinds of things. So it's more than just not remembering or not being able to form memories. But that's what people typically see. You know, they see, oh, my mom's forgetting to take her medicine or mm -hmm. she's forgetting to eat or she's repeating herself, those kinds of things. But it's way more encompassing than that. Everybody's forgetful. Um, normal human beings are forgetful. Me with my yeah. lines for acting. I mean, even on a simple level like that, but yes. Yeah, I, but I there's joke, a but difference between being forgetful and not being able to remember. Right. And that's the trick. You know, normal humans are forgetful. The difference is when you're forgetful, you can track back. And you can find it again. Maybe not always, you know, not a hundred. Everybody forgets something every now and then. Mm -hmm. But imagine, you know, you've put a set of keys in a drawer and you put them in a drawer you don't normally put them in. And then you go look for those keys and you're standing in your house. Where did I put my keys? I can't find my keys. Well, the last time I had them, I was coming in from the car. I had groceries. I did this and this and this. Oh, yeah, I put them in this drawer. That's able to track back. Now imagine uh, you have that set of that whole same scenario and you you stand there and just like, I don't know where my keys are and you're not able to track back. And then you start tearing the house apart with your spouse. And then your spouse opens the drawer and says, you put the keys in the drawer and you say, no, I didn't. Oh, I see. I didn't form a memory. Interesting. Okay. So how would I, I mean, I guess... How would I, as a lay person, just a regular person, uh, kind of in a scenario that you're talking about, how would I even recognize, how would I even begin to recognize someone who maybe is has the beginning stages of dementia? That's a really good question. Um, and And it's a really interesting thing because I believe people intuitively know when something's going on with someone else, especially somebody that you're close to. So if it's a, a spouse or a parent that you're that you're concerned about, when when our scientific part of our body, our our gut starts to say, hmm, something's not right, people do one of two things. They're like, oh, they're just old. That's normal. They're just getting old. No memory loss, what we just talked about, not like truly forgetting information is not normal. Mm -hmm. Occasionally forgetting something, occasionally, you know, not paying a bill and then remembering. We've all done that. Right? Right. That's normal. It's normal for us to occasionally have trouble finding a word. That's normal. What's not normal is when people have to start, like they really struggling to find that word. Um, they start to use big, long descriptions of the item because they cannot find the word that they want to say for the item. Um, or you start to notice, you know, changes in the house, in their normal behavior. You know, a person who was extremely neat beforehand all of a sudden starts to put things out where they can see it because if they can see it, they can remember and then they'll use it. So there's subtle signs, but but honestly, most people, oh, and a very early sign, which a lot of people miss, is a personality change. Mm. Like that could be a very early, like somebody who's always been laid back and easygoing, who's all of a sudden now starting to get crotchety all the time, like I'll use my mom as an example. My mm -hmm. mom has vascular dementia. And I mentioned, you know, they were diplomats. So you have to understand that they are used to that high social setting, right? They've been to the Nobel Peace Prize and stuff like that. So they know how to act in a social situation. And many, many years ago, about maybe 10 years ago or so, I took my mom to a social event. And um, she would always greet people and shake their hand and everything. And she just folded her arms around her and said, I don't touch people. Hmm. And they, I'm like, that was odd. 
but I didn't really put it together at that time. And that is where I can track back to the first time that I started to see these changes in my mom. And it's always hindsight, you know, that that piece comes early. And so some personality changes. Other subtle ways people show changes are um, and this is a hard one because it's extremely easy to get scammed, but people get scammed. They'll they'll step into a scam very easily. That was one of my dad's first signs is he got scammed out of money. Or they start reporting they got lost. Or, you know, just these little subtle things. But But really, honestly, when people start to not form a memory, and they ask you the same question over and over again within a short period of time, or it just seems like the conversation is the same conversation every time because they don't remember that they've had that conversation with you. Those are very um, good ways to start to say, oh, maybe there's a problem. We need to check it out. Interesting. So do people who have dementia also, like I think you mentioned earlier, sort of revert back to what they've done in the past, maybe, you know, maybe a child or a doll or want to play with dolls more or things like that? In an, in an, in an essence. So um, I always want to be careful when, when I, when I explain this, because an adult is always going to be adult, right? So but what happens is there's a, a, um, a theory, it's called retrogenesis. Retro lit literally means back genesis to the beginning. And it was a, it's a physician by the name of Barry Riceberg who came up with what's called the functional assessment staging tool. And what he did is he looked at people with dementia and was able to look at the progression from the beginning all the way back to the end of a dementia process and a person the way they think the way they are able to process information the way they can problem solve over time if they live long enough with dementia will look like you know will go all the way back to being bedridden and needing to be fed just like a baby so when you understand normal human development, how we're born, how we start to communicate, when we learn to walk, when we learn to manage our bowel and bladder, when we learn to control our emotions, when we learn to do all of these things, if you understand that whole journey, which we mostly everybody does because we've seen children develop, right? We, right. we know there's a reason a 17-year-old doesn't get the car keys without very high insurance, right? Because <laughs> we can't anticipate consequences. So as a person with dementia is starting to change, they will very much follow that same progression backwards. Mm. Now, what I want people to hear and understand is not all people with dementia will get to that end stage because some people will pass away before. And so it's, you know, don't worry about that. But the bigger conversation that I really want people to take away from today is that I don't think we say this early or often enough, but any person who is living with dementia, who lives long enough, will need 24-hour care. So when you get a diagnosis or have somebody in your life who gets a diagnosis of dementia, you have to already start to think about that. Because at some point or another, their thinking processes are going to, if they live long enough, going to get to the point where they cannot be home alone. And so we lose so much time to prepare for that because nobody's nobody wants to say it out loud. Right. Right? Right. So what happens is then... All of a sudden, you know, the family will have the person at home alone. They're coping, uh, but they're not thriving, but they're coping. The family can keep doing their stuff because mom's still at home alone. And then there's a crisis. 
And then mom ends up falling. She ends up in the hospital. She gets a urinary tract infection, whatever. And now all of a sudden the family's thrown into this crisis situation where the hospital staff turns around and says, they're not safe to live alone. What do you, what do you think that is attributed to? Do you think we're in denial? Do you think we just don't know? Do you think, you know? Uh, I think that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. I have thought about this a lot. Um, I think there are a lot of reasons. Number one, um, you know, there, there are three different types of caregivers. There are spousal caregivers. So a, a husband with a wife who has dementia or a wife with a husband. You have adult children, caregivers, like you or I, taking care of our parent. And now there is a new category. It's called a young adult caregiver. They're between the ages of 18 and 45 who are becoming caregivers to grandparents and other people. Mm, yes. So they're like three categories of <clears throat> types of caregivers. One of the biggest challenges is most people do not identify even that they are a caregiver. They don't see themselves as a caregiver. If you are picking up medicine for someone, if you're calling somebody to check on them, to make sure they're okay, if you're helping pick up groceries or cleaning the house or switching out a light bulb or doing anything that's not even personal care, is I think people think a caregiver is like, oh, I'm giving somebody a shower or I'm you know, helping them go to the bathroom. That certainly is. But the moment you start to assist someone mowing their lawn, um, any of these things, you're a caregiver. But people don't already identify that they are a caregiver. Is there a stigma attached to it, do you think? There's that's very me. much a stigma <laughs> yeah. attached to dementia. Mm. So dementia has a terrible, terrible stigma, which means, you know, and, and I understand it to a very large extent. And I honestly believe um, society, Facebook groups, uh, families going through this, uh, just a lot, a lot has played into it. There is such a negative narrative about dementia right. in, in society. And it's been very interesting because for decades, I mean, I've been, we've been living in the United States now 31 years and I've been a dementia specialist for over 20. And it's only been recently, like there are a few movies that have come out that have done a good, decent job of really explaining, you know, not just the negative tragedy narrative of dementia. Um, but there's there's a significant stigma in society related to it. Recently, I watch um, I watch some procedural TV, you know, and um, I love these medical programs, you know, think. Chicago Madden, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. In this last season, they had a, a you know, one of the characters um, developed dementia, and it was a very rapid progression from being fairly independent to being placed in a facility. And it was just this whole negative narrative, just, oh, it's tearing the family apart. Nobody, no, you know, nobody has a life, none of this stuff. And let's chuck him in a, you know, in a, in a memory care facility. And I'm like, the reality is over 60% of people with dementia are never in an institution. They are yeah. at home being cared for by families who are struggling, who don't have the right the support or the right information. I want to jump in for one second because you sure. you hit this is exactly what I was going to say. Globally, and I and I didn't know too much about dementia before, you know, I, you you and I talked, but I looked up a couple of statistics because 55 million people mm -hmm. have dementia globally. Yep. 60% of them are residing in low middle income country low to middle income countries. Yep. That's pretty staggering. Uh -huh. So someone we know, whether it's our family or someone close to us, is going to be affected by this. So you want to hear another scary Let's statistic? Let's go. Yes. Every 65 seconds in the United States, somebody is being diagnosed or developing dementia. Mm. 65 seconds. That's a lot of That's people. That's a lot. 
And what I find really frustrating is that it's, um, you're, a, I don't know exactly how old you are, but I can see you and I are probably not super far in mm -hmm. age. Um, you remember when AIDS came about? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you remember the whole terrible narrative and, and, and how horrible it was and how stigmatized, stigmatized those people yeah, were, right? right? Mm -hmm. And with, with cancer, like when people got cancer 50 years ago, it was the, you have the C word, right? right? And it was this terrible and everybody died because we didn't have good treatment. That's what dementia is right now. There is the significant stigma related to dementia. And I understand why, because, you know, we, we're a body and then we are what we think. That's who we are. That's our personality. Right. That's what houses our preferences and our talents and our values and our memories and our autonomy. And all of these things are housed up in our thinking. And so when a person's thinking changes, people want to hide it. Mm -hmm. They don't want other people to know they're struggling. And so what ends up happening is, number one, people don't want to, back to the whole caregiver thing, if I admit my mom has trouble thinking, then I all of a sudden recognize I'm going to have to do something different. And that directly impacts me in my life. And I don't want it to. Do you think that we have a problem, especially in this society where we don't value the older people, where we don't put others, sometimes others' needs beside us or in front of ours, especially with parents and older people? It seems like in this country, I don't know, you know, in most places, you know, some Asian cultures, they uplift the older right. generation. They take the wisdom. They, you know, but it seems like in this country, we just sort of push them aside and we, you know, still go forward with what we want to do. And it's just, yeah, we'll give them a little bit or we'll put them away or we'll discard people. Very, very much so. You yeah. know, it's a very individualistic society. Um, the Western society is very, very in individualistic. But what I find interesting <laughs> is that the history of um, dementia, because I actually did a podcast episode that should come out, I think, next week on the history of dementia. I found a nice um, research paper that somebody had done on the history of Alzheimer's. And the, the, the word Alzheimer's was coined in 1910, I believe it was. And so that's only 114 years ago that the word Alzheimer's came about. And that's around the same time in the early 1900s that nursing homes came about. Hmm. But dementia is like the first recorded history that they can trace back is already into the ancient Egyptians. So it's not a new thing. But it's, but it's, you know, certain things are probably newer because there's definitely a correlation between blood sugar and healthy lifestyle and alcohol and what we eat and toxicity. And all of these things probably play a role in some of the types or subtypes of dementia. But dementia is not new. It's been around for thousands of years. Right. And where were those people before? They were not in an institution. Right. They were being taken care of by other people at home. So, you know, we've we've created this monster by having this terrible narrative out in society that this is the worst thing that can happen to you. Well, you know what? Death sucks. Yeah. Um, and if you've had anybody you've ever loved walk through a cancer journey, if they, like I had a friend recently who died of, um, she had um, bladder cancer. She was 64, no, 69. And from diagnosis to death was six weeks. And in that six weeks period, 
I saw her go through the exact same progression as somebody with dementia, mm -hmm. but just in a shorter period. Like as her body was shutting down, right. she changed, she, she did the exact same thing. We go back to the beginning. Everybody, unless you're, unless you're walking and, you know, you have a massive heart attack and die, or you get hit by a car and die, when people go through a natural death process, it looks the same as dementia. Right. It's just shorter. Dementia is over an extended period of time. Now, I want to, I want to share a little something with you, too, because in, even in my own family, we're having a little problem with this now. And I'm not sure what it is, which is also why I wanted you to be on the show so I could learn a little bit more. Well, go for um, it. A relative of mine has sort of had, we're not sure if it's a series of back in the hospital because she hasn't eaten, she doesn't want to eat, you know, a series of events. Um, so we're not even sure what's going on now. What, I, I don't even know what I could ask you. What do you think the possibility of it could be? So what I would be asking is that they test her in the hospital mm -hmm. for dementia. For dementia. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes humans are very, very good at adapting. And we are extremely good at hiding things. And when we are in a normal uh, routine, we're able to hide it better. So we all we all have routines. Every single one of us get dressed the same way. We brush our teeth the same way. We use our environment to keep us on track. You know, you, you don't even necessarily need to look at your watch to know it's close to your bedtime because you have a body clock that kind of keeps you on track. So when we're in our own home and when we are in our normal routine, for a very long time, we can adapt and adapt and hide it from other people to a large extent. Now, take that person out of that normal routine and put them in an unfamiliar surrounding where they don't have that stuff to help them anymore. Mm -hmm. Their inability to problem solve or make decisions or prioritize or uh, remember things becomes magnified. And so while she's in the hospital, you can certainly ask the doctors to get an occupational therapy evaluation or speech therapy evaluation of their thinking processes to see if you can get a standardized test that can show whether or not they're actually having trouble. Oftentimes, these types of situations are usually diagnosed when a person's in the hospital for something else. And in relation to families that are squeaky wheel and saying, Houston, there's a problem mm -hmm. because I can guarantee you doctors don't want to diagnose this. They don't want to diagnose it because they feel like there's nothing that they can do to help the person, which means you guys are struggling on your own. You don't even have a diagnosis. You can go Google right. to try to find out more information to even get yourself help. So what you're doing is doing the best you can with the information you have and trying to take care of somebody, but you're not being empowered with the solutions that can actually help you take care of that. Right. Which is now I want to talk about what you actually do, uh -huh. you know, in terms of your courses and, and teachings to help people get a better idea of what they can do to deal with this. What is it that you do? So my background is an occupational mm -hmm. therapist, and I've specialized in dementia for the last, I don't know, 20 years. Um, my very first recognition of the first patient that I can track back to now was when I was a student, and I had no idea what to do with her. Um, she was in a psychiatric hospital in South Africa and was walking up and down the hall, um, you know, telling everybody, I'm tired. I'm so very, very tired. She never sat down. She just paced up and down. And I had no idea what to do with her. Um, and then many, many years later, I just, I started to recognize, we moved to the States and I started working in nursing homes. And then I had this realization that um, people in nursing homes were frequently staying in a nursing home, not because they necessarily needed the physical assistance, 
but because they couldn't think for themselves. So a lot of people believe people are in nursing homes because they physically need help. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a component of it. But a lot of people in nursing homes are in nursing homes that can move around fine. They just cannot think for themselves, so they cannot go home. And then I started to recognize I don't really know much about how our brain works and, and all of that. So I started to specialize in it. But to come back to your, your question related to what it is that I do, I don't practice as an occupational therapist anymore. Uh, what their own inherent strengths are as a caregiver, because we all have strengths. Right. Um, how stressed they might be, because people come to me either at the start of a journey and they're very proactive and they're doing okay, or they're in Houston, there's a fire and I got to put it out. Right. So if I start working with somebody who's in a crisis situation, it looks very different than somebody who is just starting out this journey, but is proactive about it. So we look at the caregiver and then I figure out based on interviews and my experience, kind of where in this journey the person is so that I can help um, start to educate the family. Then the second thing that I teach people to do is how to actually speak dementia because it's like another language. How to speak dementia. I love that. How to speak okay. Dementia. Um, because the reality is the moment somebody is has this going on, uh, we have a broken brain on the inside. But it's not like an amputation that you can see. Like when somebody has a below the knee amputation and you see that and they have their prosthesis, you know that they cannot walk without their prosthesis. You can see something's wrong. But a person who is starting to change in how they're thinking and they lose the ability to reason, we have to start to communicate differently. Mm -hmm. So, you know, related to a spouse, you've been married for 50 years, you've been communicating for 50 years in a specific way, and now you cannot communicate that way. And so you got to change how you talk to the person, how you respond to them. And so I teach people how to speak dementia so that we don't get into these crisis situations, these flare-ups. Um, they're called in in society challenging behaviors. And I hate that term because it's challenging to who? It's challenging to me. It's not challenging to the person. Right. And what I call them, they're normal human behavior, but it's magnified. We've seen this throughout our whole entire existence this is making so much sense to me. And, you know, like I said, I'm uh, applying this to my own personal situation. It, everything is making sense now. It makes oh, so wonderful. much sense. That's yeah. good. Then the third part that I do is I work with the caregiver when they are, when they're the one that's burning out to be able to, there's a significant, significant mental component to being a caregiver. So you mentioned you're an actor, mm -hmm. right? So when you go into an acting role. If you don't believe that you can be that person that you're portraying, you're never going to be successful in that role. And so the same thing with a caregiver. If a caregiver only believes this doom and gloom and woe is me, guess what they get? This doom and gloom and woe is me. And so we work very hard on, on how you think about being a caregiver, being grateful for what you still have framing your mind, becoming resilient, teaching yourself gratitude and all of these, you know, emotional side of the caregiver to protect the caregiver from burning out. And then the last part is I work with planning ahead for people mm -hmm. because I can tell you, you know, every person's family is different and I'm not talking about money. Right. Money, money can solve all sorts of issues, but I've seen the poorest of poor families keep a person with dementia at home successfully for decades because they they decided that that was what they were going to do. That's what they chose to do and they wanted to do it and they do it successfully. And I've seen people with all the money in the world throw somebody in a in a facility uh, because they don't want to put that effort in. So it, you know, it, it certainly, it, I look at the whole picture related to 
who the players are, who who the decision makers are, how to plan for it. I have a client who is a 53-year-old woman who has a 15-year-old and a husband with dementia. So her plan looks different than the spouse who has been married for 50 years and is taking care of his wife at home. So each person's plan is different. They're unique and different, but they're commonalities. And when you've seen thousands of these situations over decades, you can pull out the commonalities. Whereas for you, it's like, oh my goodness, I don't know what to do. Right. What are my options? Mm-hmm. Interesting. I read something on your website too. It said 30% of the caregivers die before the person they yeah. help. That's And that's a very difficult statistic to actually get. Yeah. And I've been, like I pulled the Alzheimer's um 2024 Alzheimer's disease um, facts and figures report that the Alzheimer's Association pulls puts out, and one of the one of the ones that I um I meant wanted to mention is that um the two statistics I've seen is 18 percent and then 41 percent of caregivers die before the person that they're taking care of specifically with dementia, and of course that's a very difficult statistic to come about because how do you how do you find that data right that data right yeah. so that's why i can't kind of use the 30 percent um because the the reports are anywhere between 18 and 41 percent of people um but the statistics are very very high that family caregivers and they're more likely the spouse because they don't take care of themselves yes there you have it So what can you do for us? Do you give workshops? How can we find out more to help us individually to do something? I do a lot of different free opportunities. Mm -hmm. I have a free workshop I do once a month. Um, It's called, it's, it's related to the challenging behaviors because that's what people typically struggle with the most. So I do that once a month. I will do a live audit i call it a a dementia flight audit where i would bring somebody like you on say you knew that this family member and you had a specific situation and i would coach you through that on a on a podcast episode and then i do a monthly meetup where people can meet with me in a zoom room and ask me questions related to their specific situation and i'll help them that way so those are three easy ways that people can can get some free um, help related to dementia and dementia caregiving. I love that. So tell everybody how we can reach you. How can we get in touch with you? How can we find out more information? This has been so enlightening. Well, thank you so much. So the the uh, the my primary website is called thinkdifferentdementia.com. The easiest way, like I love to connect with people, um, the easiest way if p- somebody wants to really get a hold of me is just to email me at Lizette at thinkdifferentdementia.com. Um, I have a free Facebook group. I just recently rebranded um, to serving more. My Facebook group is more for Christian dementia caregiving. Um, but that doesn't mean not everybody in the group is Christian and people can certainly join. Um, I'm, I'm just upfront about the fact that I answer all my questions through a Christian worldview lens because, you know, if like I'll use my my one client, he's a 32 year old grandson. And I asked him, I'm like, are you married? And he's like, no, but what does that have to do with me helping my grandmother? Well, it has something to do with you helping your grandmother if you're married, because then your primary responsibility is your wife and your family and not your grandmother. And he's like, oh. So, you know, I frame all of my decisions through a biblical lens, but people can join my free Facebook group. It's um, Christian Dementia Caregiving. They can listen to my podcast. Um, They will get a lot of very different uh, viewpoints (laughs) related to dementia and dementia caregiving because I bring in a lot of different um, mindset ideas that that's not commonly out in, in the dementia caregiving space. And so I'm a little unique and different, Um, definitely have a tremendous sense of humor, but those are the primary ways that people can, can get a hold of me. 
Oh my gosh, Lizette, thank you so much for spending some time here on One Mic Night Talk. This is, as I said, been very enlightening and applicable to my own situation, as well as many, because as we oh, said, so sure. many people in, you know, in the near future, 7 million people live with Alzheimer's now, and by 2050, 13 million. So mm -hmm. that's double. So as I said, it's affecting so many people looking out for signs, trying to diagnose and what stress is going to cause on our own family is important. Yeah, and if sure. you have solutions, thank you so much. Everyone, please make sure you reach out to Lizette, Lizette Kluta, and join, the, <laughs> join her Facebook group. You can listen to her podcast. It's called A Podcast, A Season of Giving. Make sure you reach out to her. Thank you so much for spending some time here on One Mic Night. Everyone, please make sure you like the episode and share, share, share this valuable information. This is One Mike Night Talk. You can find us at One Mike Night. One Mike Night is spelled O-N-E-M-I-C-N-I-T-E. -E. You can always slide into my DMs at, on Instagram at Marcos Luis, M-A-R-C-O-S-L-U-I-S. Thank you. And if you'd like to support this podcast, you can also find that in the notes of this episode. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.